Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Refocus webinar series. My name is Ashley Hood Morley. I'm the Senior Director of Sustainability and Materials at the Plastics Industry Association. Uh, my role here includes serving as the staff liaison for several different um, committees, one of which is the Recycling Committee. And through that Recycling Committee and our Events and Education Subcommittee, we host an annual event called the Refocus Sustainability and Recycling Summit. And while we're really disappointed that last week we weren't all together in Cincinnati, Ohio for our event, uh, we're really excited um, that to announce that we've put together uh, this webinar series that will go on monthly throughout the rest of 2020. So we're really pleased that um, we're able to find a way to stay connected um, to all of our friends in the classic supply chain. So today I'm going to be hosting uh, this program along with our moderator, Mark Richardson from Series 1. And before I turn this over to Mark, um, I just want to make a few opening remarks. So first and foremost, I want to send my sincere appreciation to our sponsors for this program today. Um, Midland Compounding and Consulting, Plastic Machinery Magazine, Plastics Recycling Magazine, and Star Plastics. These companies have absolutely been instrumental in the success of our summit um, while we have it in person each year. And we really appreciate their flexibility with us um, in 2020 in shifting their sponsorship to this virtual program offering. Um, thanks to them, we were able to share this program with a lot of people this year. Um, and I'm really, really pleased with the high number um, of, of people that we have um, on the call with us today. So. Thanks again to those sponsors. Um, and as noted, this webinar series will continue throughout the duration of 2020. So if you'd like to uh, join this prestigious group of sponsors, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. The second group of people that I'd like to recognize um, are our media partners. So a special thanks to Mold Making Technology, Plastic Machinery Magazine, Plastics News, Plastics Technology, and Recycling Today. Um, these folks have always been uh, wonderful year after year in helping us get the word out about our event um, and helping to promote the various sessions and do great follow up um, with a lot of our speakers. So thank you to our media partners. So next year, um, I know that many of you will be ready to, uh, to get back out of uh, quarantine and we hope to see all of you um, at our next in-person event. So we will be co-located with MPE 2021 in Orlando, Florida at the Orange County Convention Center. And in an effort to make sure that you can still spend plenty of time on the show floor, um, we'll, our plan for next year is to have an abbreviated event um, that will be on Wednesday, May 19th. So save the date for, um, for next year in Orlando. And then also we're happy to announce that we've made arrangements to be back in Cincinnati um, in 2022. So um, please also save that date. We were able to shift many of our planned events from 2020 to 2022, including our tour of the Influx facility as well as the local Rumpke Merck. So we're really excited uh, that we will have an opportunity um, to be in Cincinnati. And so finally, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Although attendee lines are all currently muted, um, we will offer a Q&A session after all of the speakers present their slides. Please keep in mind during this time that um, when you are posing questions that we will abide by antitrust rules and refrain from discussing any specific pricing, production, marketing strategies, anything that could be construed as market manipulation, we will not be addressing um, during the presentations nor during the Q&A session of this program today. Um, also, I'd like to notify all attendees that this is a public education session where non-members and press may be present. We will not be conducting any official business of the association today. This session is being recorded and slides will be made available from those speakers who have agreed um, to share their material. And to access the recording and those slides, um, you will be receiving a follow-up email um, from Plastics 
um, asking you to take just a really short two minute survey. And um, as we do a lot of the times at the end of that survey, um, we're going to provide you with a link to the recording today and to the slides. So um, keep that in mind. And finally, just one more reminder, there is a question box feature as part of the GoToWebinar um, panel on the side of your screen. So throughout the webinar, um, if you have anything that pops up that you'd like to ask a speaker, please go ahead and jot those down at any time um, during the presentation. And once again, all, once all the speakers complete their um, presentation, we will do, a, uh, we'll pull everyone together at the end and have that Q&A session um, with all the speakers together. So. Now, without further ado, I want to introduce our moderator of today, Mark Richardson. So Mark is a mechanical and manufacturing engineer and is the co-founder and a principal for Series 1. Series 1 specializes in consulting, business and development support for plastics processing and product development, recycled materials and sustainability programs, as well as process optimization. Mark has spent his entire career in plastics and has deep ties to the industry through his membership in both the Plastics Industry Association as well as, as the Society of Plastics Engineers. He began as an advanced product engineer of interior systems in the autom automotive industry, then worked as a plastics manufacturing engineer in the chemical industry and was faculty at Kettering University in Flint, Michigan in the industrial and manufacturing engineering department. During his time at Kettering, he initiated the installment of a plastic manufacturing lab and taught coursework in plastic processing with a focus on sustainability. He's also served as faculty at the School of Engineering and Computer Science at Oakland University. There at Oakland, he taught polymeric materials and processes. And more recently, Mark has spent considerable time developing and launching several businesses surrounding sustainability opportunities with post-industrial, post-consumer, and marine waste plastics. So, um, as you can tell with Mark's background, I mean, he is uh, one of our valued members of the Plastics Industry Association, of the Recycling Committee, um, and I don't think there's anybody better suited to kind of take over and uh, help walk us through this really awesome topic um, that we have for you guys today. So with that, I'll turn the meeting over to Mark. Mark, if you want to go ahead and unmute um, and take it away, and I will uh, get you going here. Thanks, Ashley. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, absolutely. Very good. So I'm happy to be here today moderating this session for everyone. And uh, I this is a little interesting for me because I'm typically on the other side of the lens. Many of you would recognize me with a camera in front of my face because I'm often doing professional photo and video services for the plastics industry um, at many of our events. So um, it's good to be here. So. Um, uh, when the opportunity came up for us to talk about this very important topic um, where ocean plastics are concerned, um, I, I realized that in my work as an engineering consultant um, and as a member of, of uh, several of the industry committees uh, at Plastics, like Ashley had mentioned, I've heard a lot of information about ocean plastics in the last year, as I'm sure most of you have had, have too. Um, there have been many cleanup efforts involving a variety of technologies uh, that have been implemented and frankly have had a range of results um, additionally through the work of global invest through through the work of global investigation uh, by corporations and ngos a focus has been placed on the locations that most strongly contribute to our marine debris issues um, which we've we've talked a lot about as well um, this has given rise to a con the concept of ocean bound waste management as well and that's one of the things we're going to talk about today um, one of the challenges we face as engineering and plastics professionals is understanding these separate but related efforts of ocean cleanup versus the ocean bound waste management. You know, what are they doing? How do they differ? Uh, what are the opportunities? What are the challenges? And finally, how can we help are just a few of the things that we all want to better understand. So today we have a panel of industry leaders in the global management of ocean collected plastics debris, and we will um, they will share with us their efforts and shed some light on this rapidly evolving issue. So speaking first today is Andy Schroeder. He's the co-founder of the Ocean Plastics Recovery Project. Andy has dedicated his career to the conservation of Alaska's natural resources. Originally from the Little Miami watershed of Ohio, he earned a Bachelor's of Science from the US Coast Guard Academy, 
a US CG master's license for vessels up to 200 tons and served two tours in the Coast Guard. He received an honorable discharge in 2005, founded ITN in 2006, and in 2010 became its full-time executive director. Under his direction, Island Trails Network spearheaded a marine debris program that now claims about 17 different cleanup efforts spanning Kodiak's 1,500 miles of coastline. From 2014 to 2016, he oversaw the Japan Tsunami Marine Debris Cleanup Effort on Kodiak Island, a large-scale cleanup which netted over 220 tons of marine debris from one uninhabited beach. And he lives near year-round in Kodiak, where he co-owns and operates the research vessel Steadfast and Island Sea. Next, we'll be hearing from Scott Farling, also a co-founder of the Ocean Plastics Recovery Project, Scott has dedicated his career to recovering value from waste. He graduated from Pennsylvania State University with a Bachelor's of Science in Chemical Engineering, concentration in polymer processing, and minor in, in, in environmental engineering in 1995. After more than a decade in the chemical industry, Scott shifted careers to focus on recovering value from complex waste streams at NBA Polymers, Agilix Corporation, and Titus MRF Services where his roles included operations management, process development, waste plastics research, and business development. Scott also serves on the, boards of, on the board of Oregon Green Schools, a nonprofit dedicated to energizing and engaging students through student-driven activities that advance their understanding and ownership of sustainability. Next up, we'll hear from Ryan Shonicki, <clears throat> co-founder and president of Ocean Cycle. Ryan Shoniki is the co-founder and president of Ocean Cycle, a social enterprise reimagining the circular economy through sourcing, certifying, and reusing materials to prevent ocean plastic pollution. Ryan has always had a passion for tying sustainability to business. Prior to Ocean Cycle, Ryan co-founded an eyewear company and released one of the first ocean plastic products on the market. In his quest to end ocean plastic pollution, Ryan has traveled around the world engaging across the plastics value chain and working with local community collection networks up, up to the Fortune 500 companies. Before his work in ocean plastic, he founded a national campaign to educate millennials about economic issues and worked in the solar industry. And finally today, we'll be hearing from Scott Howard, the CEO of Polyvisions. Scott has spent his entire career also in the plastics industry. He joined specialty adhesive film producer Bemis Associates in 1985 and enjoyed 30 years of growth with the with the business as a quality manager, director of product development, and chief operating officer. Scott has Scott was fortunate to be part of the team that transferred Bemis from a small family firm to a global leader in adhesive films. The growth was largely from developing unique, highly engineered thermoplastics for new markets and applications. Scott has a passion for bringing new ideas and products to market. Bemis acquired specialty compounder producer Polyvisions in 2013. Since then, Scott has led the company in the development of high recycled content materials for use in durable goods applications. Polyvisions is at the forefront of the effort to revalue plastics. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Andy to start off our webinar. Perfect, so I will turn over the controls to you, Andy, just a moment. Okay, Andy, you should be able to uh, control your slides now and take it away. All right, thanks, Ashley and Mark. Um, so our presentation is called, Is There a Home for Ocean Plastic? Um, my story, I'm gonna take the first part of this and then turn it off to Scott. Um, turn it over to Scott at a certain point in the story. My involvement with uh, Ocean Plastics started in Kodiak, uh, my home. Kodiak's an island community in southwest Alaska, about 250 miles southwest of Anchorage, and you can only get there by plane or ferry. It's a Coast Guard town, as Mark said, that's what first brought me there, and it's a commercial fishing town. Uh, if you look on the horizon in this photo, you can see the little fireflies, um, which are actually fishing boats. Uh, in 2000. 2005, I was in my 20s, uh, just a few months out of the Coast Guard, um, coasting a little bit and taking time looking at my next career. 
Um, I had started a guiding business, taking people out sea kayaking, and on this day, the photo, the day this photo was taken, I was taking a lunch on a multi-day paddling expedition, and I found this little green plastic frog. Um, uh, it turned out to be one of the famous floaties bathtub toys. And the story um, hadn't really broken yet, but I was sort of enchanted by this little this little thing. And I remember being I remember being turned off by all the plastic in the coastal environment and always getting questions about it uh, from the people I was with. I was a guide, so it was my responsibility to interpret pretty much everything in the landscape. Um, and I had to explain ocean plastics the same way that I did with wildlife in the landscapes. Um, about a year and a half later, um, this article came out in Harper's Weekly. Uh, excuse me, I went forward one. This article came out in Harper's Weekly. It told the story of the floaties. Um, it's, uh, it, there was a container spill off of Hawaii that sent little bathtub toys all over the Pacific, um, from Alaska to California, and even into the Atlantic, meaning they took the Northwest Passage. Um, and so I, I had found one of them and, and had kept it. Um, what I learned in the article and the literature that followed it, it eventually turned into a book, um, was that behind these little cute little toys was that this stuff wasn't just an eyesore, uh, but it was dangerous. Um, it was a hazard to navigation, like this one ton piece of line that we found um, that could easily disable any ship that would run over it. It's entangling to wildlife, particularly marine mammals. Uh, this is an endangered stellar sea lion that a friend of mine photographed right outside Kodiak in 2006. You can see a packing ban. Um, getting tighter and tighter around his neck as he grows. It's ingested by seabirds, um, like this well this well documented albatross. This ran in National Geographic, who died of starvation on Midway Island, but with a gut full of plastic. And so you can see laid out there are the are the plastic that they removed from its stomach. And it's ingested by fish, um, like this young of the year Pacific cod that a biologist friend of mine caught just a few months ago near Kodiak. Um, that's about a one millimeter piece of plastic pulled from its stomach. And it's making its way into the food chain where the impacts on human health are really not completely understood. And what happens when plastic gets into our bodies, of course, is a, a subject maybe for another day. Um, but the discovery of this little frog was the beginning of my career in ocean plastic, which sometimes I just, I call marine debris and I use the two interchangeably. In 2006, I founded Island Trails Network uh, which is a nonprofit which develops, maintains, and promotes trails, waterways, and coastlines, including marine debris cleanup. In those days, marine debris and ocean plastics wasn't, uh, were not household terms, um, but I still found like-minded NGOs and agencies who would fund my work. As our program grew, we found ourselves organizing larger and larger groups of volunteers. Um, we pushed the limits of what these small grants could provide and pushed the boundaries of where our pickup trucks could take us. The more we searched, the more we found. In fact, it was nearly impossible to find a segment of shoreline with a view of the horizon, which wasn't littered with ocean plastic. There simply wasn't enough money to properly address the issue or enough volunteers. Um, so soon I wasn't walking the beaches alone, with, but with uh, teams of people. Uh, we weren't finished in a day, but instead we stayed for weeks. We didn't go home at night. We slept in a tent camp or lived on board a boat. And the logistics of these cleanups are complicated. I live in a world that's mostly roadless. Um, we needed different boats, aircraft, and accommodations for each new site. In my first five years, I tried just about everything uh, using what resources we had and some Alaskan ingenuity. But sometimes you just have to have the right tool for the job. Cleaning the ocean is a big job, and naturally we, make, we look for ways to make it easy. And I hope that one day we can build a clever machine that can filter stuff out of the middle of the ocean. And there's been a lot of interest and investment in passive collection. And I'm rooting for those efforts that are currently underway. But the reality in my world, the reality of coastal cleanups as opposed to offshore cleanups is that it's not a passive, but an active process. It's really hard work and there's no machine that's gonna do it for you. And the, coast, and the coastal zone is where the environmental impact is happening now. The only way to scare, scale the effort near shore is to put more people on the beach and have them pull hard together. The coastline itself is so variable um, from substrates under your feet um, to the prevailing wind and wave action, and those are just the characteristics we can see. 
The oceanographic forces at work here are what really filter and distribute ocean plastics, and the characteristics of this stuff uh, become as specialized as the ecosystem itself. And it's remarkable to me, whether we're talking about natural materials or man-made, how fine materials end up with other fines, like these tiny bits of polystyrene you can see on the right, shredded by the elements. You see that and you, you wonder, wouldn't it have been nice to catch this earlier? Wouldn't it have been nice to catch this huge piece of polystyrene and just bag it up before it became 10,000 tiny bits? And likewise, coarse plastics end up with natural materials of roughly the same size. This is a photo from Kayak Island. At some point, you can't, uh, you can no longer distinguish what's man-made from the natural environment. So I would ask you to guess which one of these is polyurethane and which one is pumice. The critters out there don't care whether it's a man-made material or not. It might just look like a good place to call home. And after a while, some of the plastics are buried and become part of the archeological record. Uh, once a piece of ocean plastic finds its way into a bank like this, it won't stay there forever. In the lifespan of plastics being produced today, we'll see seismic events which change land elevations. Uh, we'll see sea level rise. And, and of course, we're going to see extreme tidal and weather events. Um, so this bottle of cleaning agent will endure all of that and more before it finally breaks apart and absorbs and is absorbed by the natural environment. In 2011, a tsunami occurred in Japan, which washed away whole villages, killed over 19,000 people, and it turned loose one and a half million tons of floating debris. And the first of this stuff started washing up um, all the way over here in Alaska just a year later. And in spite of the lo uh, loss of life and economic disaster um, that Japan had, they sent what they called a gift of $6 million to the U.S. to assist with cleanup. And those of us that were impacted by the tsunami would be asked to scale up our operations. The tsunami response pushed me out of my com comfort zone. Um, up until that point, I had only done work in removal work in the Kodiak archipelago, which was plenty big enough for me. We've got 1,500 miles of coastline on my island alone. Um, but the new assignment was Kayak Island, and this was an epicenter of ocean plastic. Uh, 300 miles uh, from my home across the Gulf of Alaska. Epicenter might not be the right word um, because it implies that that's where the plastic originates. But in reality, Cody Kayak Island just seemed to be where all of it was washing up. So in 2014, um, I handpicked a crew from Kodiak and we started on a six week effort uh, to clean up the east side of Kayak Island. Uh, the place is uninhabited and rarely gets visitors. There's an abandoned uh, lighthouse on the on the tip of the island um, but nevertheless when we got there we found we weren't alone so with help from the gift of japan we had the means to scale up the size and intensity of our effort uh, with our project budgets now into the six figures for the first time i paid my crews and we worked 10 to 12 hour days and i learned to use different sets of tools helicopters tugboats and barges to do the work and of course, we always use whatever's available. Um, this is actually, this boat had Japanese characters on it, and this was another casualty of the tsunami. And we pulled off a big cleanup that year. Um, I came out of the experience with some new beliefs. Um, first, if we didn't change the way we're doing things, that we wouldn't see the end of ocean plastic in my lifetime. Second, I was okay with that. I was ready to dedicate my career to this, but that I wouldn't just toil away in solitude. I needed to tell a better story of what I was seeing out there. And third, all this stuff needed to actually go somewhere. I couldn't fathom just landfilling it all. Uh, there was so much engineering in these materials, it had to have value. Up until this point, I hadn't thought about much about recycling. I kind of mindlessly stuffed marine debris into containers and shipped it off for somebody else to sort and recycle. Kodiak's an exporter of seafood, and we have two container ships per week depart for Seattle. So being as remote as we are, I still have reasonably good access to the global supply chain. An outfit in Washington would take my containers of unsorted marine debris for free and presumably sort them enough to divert to different recycling markets. All good, right? I didn't really have any feedback mechanism, but nobody was complaining. Um, but I didn't really understand that the picture was changing. In 2013, China enacted a new policy called Operation Green, Green Fence, 
um, which in, it increased the uh, inspections of U.S. recyclables and eliminated my convenient method of disposing of marine debris. And this is happening right as the tsunami uh, debris effort got underway. My recycler in Seattle stopped returning my calls and all the ocean plastic started piling up in Kodiak. Um, the tsunami funding delayed the impact a little bit because we had contract money to pay landfills to take it. The barge you saw on the previous slide went to Seattle under an agreement with Waste Management Inc. in 2015. And the following year, another barge just like it went to Anchorage, uh, where the cream of the recyclables were stripped off by Parlay for the Oceans and the rest went to the Anchorage Municipal Landfill. Um, but now, all of a sudden, my biggest problem was not the collection of these materials. I knew where, ocean, where to find ocean plastic, and I knew I could do good. Um, but what did you do with it then? What, what, did I, what was I to do with 100, or toast, 100 tons of it that either I had promised to clean up or had stockpiled in my yard? My local landfill had banned, um, had bland, banned ocean plastics from their facility, and I couldn't blame them. Uh, local taxpayers can't shoulder the cost of landfilling such an endless waste stream as ocean plastic. And um, besides even recyclables, we ran through our local recycling center, had mostly ended up in China. Um, so my cleanups continued at reduced levels uh, after the tsunami funding ran out. But I figured by then that there really wasn't an end game for this stuff. There was no fitting end of life, no recycling. Uh, the technology just wasn't there or the infrastructure wasn't there. There was no home for ocean plastics. And then I met Scott Farling. And before Scott, I should say, Scott and I were introduced by, um, by Bree Wittabine, my friend, uh, a marine mammal biologist who she had recently moved from Kodiak, where I live, to Portland, where Scott lives. Bree had the really cool job of trying to disentangle whales from nets and lines. She told me she had a friend who knew a lot about recycling plastics, especially the hardest to recycle stuff. And I said, I've got to meet this guy. And she brought him up to Kodiak for a visit. And we spent the day together surveying whales. Uh, that was in July 2018. And afterwards, I gave him a tour of my stockpile. I showed him plastics that were photodegraded, caked with salt, uh, caked with sand, or embedded with rocks. I showed him plastics that were, I showed him bottles from all over the world um, with characters I didn't recognize. Um, bottles that were fouled with organics or crushed beyond all recognition. And in Scott's typical understated style, for those of you who know him, he said, I think I can help. Uh, so that day for me was the beginning of what would become the Ocean Plastics Recovery Project. And I'm honored to be uh, speaking with him here today. And I'm going to let him tell you our story from there. Wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, the background and for kicking us off today, Andy. Um, Scott, I am going to turn the control over to uh, you now and uh, ask you to. Go ahead and turn on your webcam for us. And I think a lot of you, uh, this will be a familiar face. A lot of you know Scott. And so Scott, with uh, Andy's background there, um, I will turn this over to you and let you uh, continue the, the story. Okay, I think I have control. Perfect, and we can hear you just fine, so thanks. All right, the delay, I don't, oh, there it is. <clears throat> so, uh, so is there a home for ocean plastics? Um, it's a tough question um, to answer. Uh, we know that some people have had success. Some smart people like Tamsin Edipa and the folks at Envision Plastics years ago created the, uh, the method soap bottle made from ocean recovered materials. But most people that try uh, to recover the ocean recovered plastics, the stuff that comes directly from the ocean or from the beaches after spending uh, some time in the ocean have have, uh, have encountered challenges and 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 really reached an end point where they couldn't couldn't recover the material uh, in any valuable sense and so um, you know we we started uh, initially looking for solutions that already existed uh, but after several months of working with Andy we realized that we really needed to study the material more closely and uh, work on sorting and pre-processing methods in order to create more useful categories uh, that, that might have a chance for recycling. And so with my experience at MBA Polymers and Agilix and, uh, and Titus Murph Services, I thought who, who better than me to, to, 
to help Andy in this endeavor, so why not? <laughs> um, after, uh, after consulting a number of colleagues uh, and other experts in plastics recycling, um, Andy and I decided to create the Ocean Plastics Recovery Project with a mission of continuing to remove the ocean plastics from the natural environment, to identify and develop reuse and recycling alternatives, and to share what we learned with the global community. And we frame this in, uh, in four focus areas, the collection, the outreach, research, and education. Um, for today, we'll touch on most of these, but really focus in on the research process that we're following. So for collection, as Andy mentioned, we, we have our operations based out of Kodiak, Alaska. Um, we, we typically do a boat-based collection where the boat gets us to the space where we're gonna work, and then uh, we use landing crafts to access the beaches and the marine debris cleanups all by hand. Um, it's hard work, um, but we can generate um, uh, a lot of material in a short amount of time. Uh, typically our expeditions are about five to 10 days, um, and we, we've had to come back to port halfway through in order to offload a full boat. Um, as far as outreach goes, we're, we're really um, working to share our story um, and collaborate with others involved in ocean plastics research uh, and cleanup so that we can learn from and, and, and assist each other in moving forward. Um, as, a, as part of this effort, uh, we're sharing some of what we're doing through a documentary film that we're working on with a filmmaker out of Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, that's a longer term process, uh, but we're, we're excited that he's also working on a, another project that'll highlight some of our work uh, in the near future. And then research is where we really want to spend most of our time talking today. Um, we want to talk about characterization of the waste stream, um, some of the pre-processing operations that are necessary in order to prepare it for recycling. Uh, and then the basic research to determine uh, what technologies can be useful in, in solving the problems of, of uh, recovering value from ocean plastics. Uh, we'll talk about mapping supply and demand and then applied research um, so that we connect that supply and demand. So first, we need to know what we're working with. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> the uh, the materials are, are uh, a mix of all kinds of different plastics and conditions and sources. And so what we need to do is start to break them down and, and really understand what, the, what, what we're dealing with. So we start with looking at the types of materials, the sources and the hazards. Um, we mostly focus on ocean recovered materials, uh, but we do a little bit of work with end of life fishing gear. Um, the sources of material uh, is not so important for uh, solving re recycling recovery um, problems, but it is interesting to understand where the materials are coming from. So a lot of what we see in Alaska uh, has come across the, uh, the Pacific, uh, the North Pacific Current, and then up into the Alaska Current and deposited on the coastlines, but it's come from, from Southeast Asia. Um, and so it's interesting to be able to track where these materials have come from uh, as an important piece of data in helping solve the problem of leakage into the ocean in the first place. And then we also look at the hazards. And mostly here, we're, we're concerned with entanglement versus non-entanglement. And that has a lot to do with the funding uh, associated with cleanups. And then we dig into the more detailed analysis of the material. So we start with the form. Uh, we look at rigid plastics versus films and foams and filaments. We then dig in further and, um, and, and start to investigate the resin type. Um, so we do this based on experience, uh, based on resin identification codes that are visible on the materials, uh, and using techniques such as near-infrared spectroscopy. Um, for some materials like black plastics or multi-filament ropes and, uh, or nets and lines, uh, we need to use more advanced techniques like FTIR, DSC, or TGA uh, to help and analyze the materials so that we can really um, start to sort them into, into useful groupings. And then we take the next step of, of sorting by grade. And all of this comes down to trying to uh, define the waste stream in such a way that we can, we can best look at methods for recovering value from the material. Um, so for example, we'll, we'll categorize extrusion, or I mean, uh, uh, injection molded uh, buckets and crates 
uh, separate from blow molded bottles and containers. And finally, uh, this is the part that's different from a lot of the work that I normally do. Um, we really need to look at contamination and degra uh, degradation or the overall condition of materials much more closely and come up with a way to categorize based on that. Um, that's probably one of our biggest challenges. A lot of the other stuff that I've talked about is, is typical for the recycling industry to, uh, to sort materials and study materials and, and separate them in categories. But degradation is a little bit more difficult. So we, we want to be able to sort them uh, in order to get them to their highest and best use. Um, and in order to do that, we need to, we need to have some sort of limits on uh, what, what can move on to each step within the recycling hierarchy. And in the end, this is what we end up with, is a, um, a, a breakdown of the materials to a level of detail that can help inform the research that we're doing. So we'll um, be able to take it all the way down to uh, grades and levels of degradation so that we can evaluate mechanical recycling techniques. But we might also need to step back and say, well, does it make sense to do all that work and sorting? Um, or can we stop and, and maybe just create a polyolefin grade that's good for pyrolysis? Um, and this is where our basic, um, basic research comes in. We need to we need to answer a few questions. What's possible? So can we, can we upgrade the material to a point where we can mechanically recycle it, um, which uses lower energy um, and has less environmental impacts than other methods? Um, or um, can we chemically recycle it, which has the potential of creating a, a virgin equivalent resin? Um, or is the material so degraded or so difficult to process that we need to look at other options such as pyrolysis or gasification to recover some value? Next, we need to ask the question about what's feasible. Um, we need to, to evaluate the, the, technolo the technology and the economics of potential solutions to find out what's best. You know, there's a, there's a high cost in sorting all the way to a, a less degraded, injection molded uh, HDPE, um, but, but then we have a lower cost in processing perhaps. Um, at the same time, it might be less sorting to go directly to pyrolysis and then take a pathway to uh, uh, through naphtha to a virgin grade mo uh, molecule. So we've got to weigh these um, these opportunities uh, and determine what's the best path. And then finally, um, what's the best from an environmental standpoint? Uh, and this is where we consider the environmental impacts um, using tools like life cycle analysis uh, to evaluate potential solutions. The next part of our research deals with mapping supply and demand. And, and this is important in a couple of reasons. One is we don't necessarily need to do research uh, for a solution that's already been developed. We just need to find the solution. Um, so we're working with folks that are doing collection uh, as well as folks that have solutions for processing uh, more complex waste streams. Um, and we're also looking for potential demand. So those folks that have interesting technologies that we think could be applied to ocean plastics or a specific fraction of ocean plastics. Uh, next, we share that data um, uh, and we're working right now with more recycling and their recycling market development platform. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, and then finally, we identify the gaps or opportunities for applied research so that we can connect the supply and demand. So I'm sure uh, just about everybody's familiar with more recycling and the, and the excellent work they do. Um, we've been uh, talking with them recently about using their recycling markets development platform for sharing the data that we collect, um, as well as the uh, sorting protocols that we develop and the research that our partners uh, uh, are working on so that we can share this information with the global community, which is part of our mission. Um, we're still very early in this, um, so we don't have a lot to share right now, but I, I would ask everybody to, to take a look at the website. It's, it's, uh, it's where we plan to share our data. Uh, but it's also a great place to uh, to get involved in the circular economy uh, and and uh, and share tools and resources uh, throughout the platform. And then finally, probably the most exciting part of the research is the applied research, which is taking the supply 
uh, which mostly right now is the materials that we're collecting, but we're also interested in working with other folks that are collecting marine debris and working in collaboration with our university partners and leading technology providers to come up with solutions to connect the supply with demand or those potential demand opportunities. Um, and so we're looking um, across a, a range of, of areas. So everything from the collection, to size reduction, sortation, separation, uh, but also getting into the purification, formulation, and, and final recycling and recovery of the materials. <clears throat> and the partners we're working with on the university level uh, are Western Washington University, and they're focused mostly on mechanical recycling research. Uh, Purdue University, uh, uh, with a focus on chemical recycling. Many of you may have sp seen uh, uh, Dr. Wang speak um, at, at previous events uh, at the Refocus Summit. And then um, we're also working on pyrolysis and gasification in conjunction with Oregon State University. <clears throat> on the industry side, we're collaborating with and conducting research with a number of folks as well. And here's a, a list of a handful. We've, we're doing some work with BASF. They've helped some work at Western Washington University. Um, Bioselection is going to evaluate our materials in their process. Um, dent and plastics uh, here in Oregon. Uh, as soon as we uh, come through this pandemic, I think we'll be back to working with them on evaluating some of our, um, our ocean recovered polyolefins. Um, Enerchem, uh, for those of you who aren't aware of them, they're a gasification company up in Canada uh, that uh, gasifies and then converts materials into methanol and ethanol. Um, and then finally, HP and Laverne uh, are, are collaborating with us on recycling a certain fraction of the waste stream. And finally, I'd like to just wrap up with uh, a quick uh, bit about the education piece of our, uh, our organization. Uh, we work to get our university research partners out into the field. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, Merritt, Sasha, and Chris uh, who joined us last September. Uh, Merritt and Sasha are from Oregon State, and Chris is from Western Washington University. This is for an opportunity for them to get out in the field and actually see the materials that they'd be studying in the lab. Then we also have worked with some uh, some younger students. This is a group of high school students from the um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the the name of the organization right now. Um, uh, the, they they joined us for our trip in June uh, and spent eight hours a day cleaning up beaches, uh, and then also spent a couple hours a day learning about the marine uh, environment uh, with a, a marine biologist that we had along on this trip. So, uh, so with that, I'd like to thank the Plastics Industry Association for inviting us to speak today. Uh, and you can learn more about us um, uh, uh, through Facebook or uh, at OceanPlasticsRecovery.com. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Scott. That was an excellent part two of the presentation. So with that, we will switch gears. And Ryan, I'll get you queued up to keep going on this uh, for us today. So Ryan, let me turn over control to you. And you should have it now. Okay. There we go. All right, well, uh, thanks so much. And, and uh, that was an excellent presentation and I um, some great visuals. And I think it's really helpful for what we're about to talk about or what I'm about to talk about, which is how we really been trying to bring traceability and, and chain of custody into primarily ocean-bound plastics because you could see really how bad the problem is in places like Alaska. And so we're really focused on, a lot on how we can bring scale to stopping material before it enters the water. So a little bit about Ocean Cycle and who we are. We are a uh, public benefit, a U.S.-based public benefit corporation, <clears throat> which means we are both profit and purpose uh, we, uh, our purpose really is to reduce the amount of plastic flowing into the oceans. We do that primarily two ways. The first is that we've developed and, and operate a certification for ocean and ocean-bound plastics. And then uh, while we don't sell any material, we don't make any products ourselves, uh, we do work with brands and companies and manufacturers to really support the use of the certified material. So a little bit about myself and, and my co-founder, uh, Robert Goodwin. Uh, Robert and, and my past intersected in Haiti. Uh, Robert uh, 
several years ago, founded an organization called Executives Without Borders, and they went into Haiti after the 2010 earthquake um, and ultimately ended up establishing uh, recycling networks and recycling uh, collection points within the country of Haiti. And he spent many years over there working on that from the grassroots level. Uh, several years after that, uh, I was uh, looking to start a company to make products out of ocean and ocean-bound plastics. And we sourced our initial material out of Haiti. And that's really where Robert and I got together. Um, and we realized that we both had a similar view on uh, trying to address the problem at scale and, and how can that be done. And that's really where Ocean Cycle formed. So as we talk about the, the problem and, and how we think about it or how we look at it, um, plastic in the water uh, primarily originates on land. This is a number that I think a lot of people have seen uh, relates back to a couple studies that were done several years ago. Um, but uh, ocean plastic, as we see it, is primarily a land-based uh, problem, and so we are focused on addressing it there. How do we look at the issue of uh, ocean ocean-bound plastics? Well, um, our definition for that is uh, plastic collected within 30 miles of a coastline. Um, it's primarily collected from beaches and waterways and uh, rivers in those coastal areas. Um, and an important piece is that it's from a country that's lacking formal waste management. So everywhere we work, uh, there is no formalized government-run uh, management. And uh, a lot of what, what we're basing this definition on relates back to the paper that I, I think many people are familiar with, uh, uh, done by uh, Dr. Jenna Jambeck and, and, and her team about how plastic, how much plastic is in the water and how does it actually get into the water. Um, this uh, why ocean bound plastics, I think the the previous presentation, you really heard a lot about this, you know, about uh, the degradation, um, the cost and time of sorting, um, you know, some of the maybe the carbon footprint with running boats in and out of the water. Um, and, you know, what we find is that, you know, while we're focused on scale and, and volume, um, it's very, uh, it's very difficult to achieve that by pulling plastic out of the water. Um, and so we're, uh, because we want to deliver at this large scale, you know, really focused on stopping that plastic before it gets into the water. So as a, as a social uh, business, we operate on principles, and these are uh, our five key principles that we use when identifying a, a partner, a recycling or processor to certify. So the first is quality. Uh, we are looking for the absolute best processors in the world um, that can put a quality material into the market that can be used in a variety of applications. Uh, the second is once we identify someone who can do a quality material, uh, we're looking for volume because when we're talking to brands and companies about using this material, uh, you know, we want to ensure that we have the volume to meet their demands. Um, the third is, is cost. And this is a really important piece to us. We, as a company, tend to interface with procurement departments and not marketing departments. And, you know, we're focused on long-term sustained use. And so, while there is a little bit of an added cost to uh, add the traceability into the material, um, it's not so high that it would make it uh, unfeasible or, um, only, or you could only use it one time. Uh, the, the fourth piece really is traceability. Um, I'll talk about that in depth a little more later. And then the fifth and final piece is behavior change. You know, we are looking to establish a value for this plastic so that it doesn't enter the ocean in the first place. So we look at traceability as being really the key to scale. It's really the uh, the base of the pyramid as we see it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, talk of ocean plastics and ocean-bound plastics, and I think you know generally consumers are accepting of, of these terms, but um, we need to bring more confidence to what they're buying because we believe that that consumer confidence drives the demand, and ultimately that demand drives our um, our, our ability to scale up the solutions. And so when we talk about demand and, and solutions, uh, this is what we like to call the ocean cycle. It's our, our theory of change. Um, the first piece is that you have to build demand for the material. Uh, once we have demand, it allows us to uh, establish or improve collection infrastructure and networks in the areas where we work. Uh, that then trickles down into income into local communities which they can use for more food and healthcare. The products are recycled. 
um, and um, uh, then we are sold into the market. And the faster we can spin that circle, the more effect we believe we'll have on the ultimate problem. So getting a little more into our traceability and our, our chain of custody process, uh, this is a high level overview of you know, what we certify and, and, and how, we, how we operate. Uh, we primarily started uh, by certifying at the recycler or processor level and then working with them to trace their collection down to point of origin and then uh, documenting that collection from, you know, from where the bottle's picked up all the way into the recycling center. Uh, really as a result of uh, the demand from some of these recyclers and manufacturers, we've uh, begun to extend that certification and the chain of custody into the manufacturing base. Um, has been a bit delayed by uh, coronavirus, but uh, we, we do, we have picked that back up and we expect to see some certified manufacturers in, in Asia relatively shortly. And so once we identify a recycler um, to certify, we, we start off uh, by mapping the collection centers. And so this really goes back to the, the definition and how we know where the material comes from. So centers are GPS map, they're profiled and approved within a recycler's network. And, and we do this for several reasons, but one of the reasons is that you might see a recycler uh, purchase, you know, purchasing uh, plastic from all over a country, right? So we want to make sure that they're only um, using material that comes from within that 30 miles of the coastline, mismanaged waste area in, uh, in the material they're selling that's certified. So this is really what the the uh, initial piece looks like, the community collection. Um, it's, it's often, we don't, as mentioned, we don't work in formal lives collection areas. Uh, so it's often uh, people picking up uh, plastic, uh, bringing it to a local collection center, selling it, getting paid on the spot for that material, which then works its way up to the processor. So um, then we document. Uh, this is part of the chain of custody piece. We, we document every step along the way. So starting with that sale from that collector uh, to the, the, the local collection network, and then all the way on up the chain. So whether there's three steps or five steps or six steps, um, we're going to have a, uh, there's a receipt and a, and a documentation of that sale along the way. So material, once it enters, uh, goes through that chain and enters the recycler's uh, yard, I guess you'd say. It's segregated on site in, in its own area. It's labeled. Um, and then uh, it's batch processed at 100%, so it's not mixed with any uh, material from non-certified collection centers. Um, and then it um, is segregated on the, uh, the post-production side. Then when a processor makes a shipment, what they'll do is um, they will provide a report to us that looks something like this. And this report will detail um, really all the major things we need to know about. So where the material came from, uh, what collection center it was attributed to, how much was delivered, day it was delivered, down to the license plate of the truck that delivered that material, uh, information about the production, uh, which is uh, going to give us the yield and the loss. Um, and, and then ultimately the shipment information. And so an example of how this might look is that um, there's a, the processor collects say like 120 tons, it's in their segregated uh, yard at post pro or pre-processing. Uh, they then run it through the production, they lose say about 20 tons, end up with 100 tons, we'll have approximately four shipping containers worth of material, uh, we'll have those container numbers, and then we'll be able to trace it all the way down to where that material comes from. So then each report really is backed up by uh, full documentation um, and data that, uh, you know, including all the receipts and everything we had seen uh, before, as well as all the shipping information, which would include like a bill of lading, packing slips, um, container weight slips, all that type of thing. Um, one thing to point out about the certification and, and how, how we operate is that while we uh, approve a recycler and they receive a year certification, um, we then go in and check every shipment. So it's not a blanket certification, hey, you're certified, see you next year. Uh, we then, every time they send out a container that they want to be Ocean Cycle certified, 
uh, they'll upload it to us and we'll go in and we'll check everything and make sure it complies with all the needed documentation. And if so, then provide our, our stamp and the, the approval. Um, I think somebody else on the is uh, not muted. Um, of the speakers, maybe. Anyway, um, so where are we at with the um, the uh, current uh, status of the certification? Uh, right now, what we've achieved is what we believe are high volumes available, primarily in Southeast Asia. And as you heard from the previous presentation, a lot of the material they're seeing uh, wash up on those shores, they're tracing back to Southeast Asia. So that's really been our initial area of focus. Um, mainly PET available, uh, but PE and, and PP is available in lesser volume. Um, and while the certification has been slowed a little bit, our ability to certify new processors uh, uh, from coronavirus, we do anticipate uh, certifying another one to two processors this year. And then finally, uh, over the last several years, uh, we've learned a lot about how the material is collected, how it moves through that supply chain, how it's sold in, into the different markets. And so we're now developing really an online system to, tr to help track that, but really to make it the exchange of documentation between the buyers and sellers a little bit easier. So for 2020, um, we really are focused on growing the program, uh, growing certified processors and manufacturers. But also I would say that, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, we're not just a blanket certification. Um, we are in there on a day-to-day -day basis working with these processors because that's really what's needed to to make this work and make this happen. You know, these processors are, sometimes they're selling a lot, sometimes they're selling a little bit, but they, they need support to, you know, to grow their operations. So that could come in the form of us connecting a processor with, uh, you know, investors or sources of money to help expand their capacity. It certainly comes in with us uh, helping to connect them with additional demand for their certified material. And then, you know, finally, with the, the collector networks are really the base of what we're doing and, and make this whole thing work. And so it's very important to support them because if they're not healthy, if those networks break down, this, this whole thing doesn't work and that plastic ends up in the water. And so, you know, during these coronavirus times, we're, we're doing our, our part to provide food and PPE into those networks to make sure that they, they're safe. And where is the certification at today? So we have uh, achieved what we believe is a significant uh, market adoption of the material. Uh, we are now certifying over a thousand tons each month that a thousand tons is utilized in products, a range of products uh, every month. It's on uh, the shelves in, in food packaging and major grocery chains across Europe. And we'll, have, we'll see several um, products launching in the U.S. this year we're using that certified material. So from reusable bags to, to bottled water and, and something we're really uh, excited about, which is, uh, you know, more, more durable plastics, engineering grade uh, polymers. Um, and that really leads us to the, the, the last slide here and, and, and really our next uh, presenter, and that's Polyvisions. And uh, a company we're very excited to work with. They're able to take our certified material and turn it into an engineering grade resin they call DuraPet. And um, so not only is it that certified material, it's helping reduce plastic in the ocean in these really vulnerable places, uh, but as a PET material, it's able to be recycled um, in a different way. So they have, you know, their, their uh, DuraPet, they'll get into it, but a drop-in replacement for things like ABS. And so um, with that, I will uh, hand it on over to, uh, to Scott at, at Polyvisions to walk you through more of that. Wonderful. Thank you, Ryan. So I will, oh, you guys are on the ball. So we'll get switched over to Scott. And Scott, let me just hand you control and you can take it away and uh, tell your part of the story next. Okay. Okay. You should have control now, Scott. Okay. Um, thank you, Ashley, and um, thanks, Ryan, for the intro and, and everyone for listening today. Um, um, it's great to be part of this and, and a really exciting topic and something uh, we're, we're very passionate about at Polyvisions as, as well as the other folks you've heard from today. So what I'm going to talk to is Ryan set up nicely, um, turning ocean-bound PET into an engineering-grade material. Um, 
So a little bit about Polyvisions. We're a uh, thermoplastic compounding company. Um, we specialize in reactive uh, extrusion. Um, back one. Um, for, you know, been around about 25 years, um, creating unique materials through through this reactive uh, twin screw extrusion process, um, really around what we call graph polymerization. So we take a base material and we um, create a, add some other things to it and create a chemical reaction in the twin screw extruder to really completely transform the uh, polymer into something new. Um, so we, we supply pellets, that's important to know. Um, um, we're, most of you I'm sure are aware of uh, the process of uh, thermoplastic compounding using twin screw extruders. Um, um, we sell to injection molders, to plastic film manufacturers, film and sheet. Um, it can be, um, our products can be processed by any of those three. Um, Durapet, um, is a, um, it's based, the matrix uh, based polymer is bottle grade PET. Um, and it has, um, we basically graft on a, a soft segment into onto that polymer chain to, to really change it dramatically, transform it from a um, uh, packaging grade material to, a, to, a, to an engineering grade material. Um, and I'll talk a lot more about the, the uh, properties in, in a minute. Um, but in addition to, to um, Durapet, I'll, you know, I'll speak to that a lot today, but we, we are also, you know, you can really think of us as um, experts in, in modifying the PET polymer um, through um, reactive extrusion compounding. Um, and we're very passionate about sustainable materials. We use mostly, most of our products are post-consumer recycled is the main ingredient. Uh, Post-consumer post recycled PET is the main, main ingredient we use. So when we, you know, as we, as we got better and better at, at, and worked with more and more PCR, we obviously became, of the, uh, became aware of the uh, ocean plastics problem. And, and you know, um, we, we asked ourselves, how can we, you know, it's great to reuse the, the material and make it back into bottles or make it back into fiber. Um, but part, a piece that may be missing is how do, we, how, do we, how do we make it into something that will stay out of the ocean for good? And what if we could produce something that, that you could make durable parts to with from um, that were completely circular so they would never get to those areas that, that uh, Ryan and, and Scott and Andy talked about in where there isn't good recycling yet, and uh, you know they're they're likely to end up into the ocean. How could we, how can we prevent it from ever getting to that point? Um, so we've been we've been making Durapet made from PCR uh, for years. For for we have many applications where it's being used now um, to make engineer engineering grade highly engineered products, um, and in, in partnership with Ryan and Ocean Cycle. Um, it was great when we met them because it, it as he just pointed out and 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 uh, in his presentation, we had a you know certified not only for uh, origin that it is indeed ocean bound, but quality equally important the quality. You know we need we're making something that's that's durable. It's going to go into automotive or it's going to go into furniture that's got to last, or, or our personal computers or thing you know consumer electronics. It's got to last. It has to withstand. Uh, impact. Um, it's not single use in any way. So we have to be absolutely sure that the quality of the material coming into our process is is sufficient to, to guarantee a long life. And that's what we think the ocean cycle material does. Um, so a little bit about Durapet. Um, this is our Durapet, Durapet 0624. It's kind of a long name, but this is the ocean. This is made from ocean bound. It's a graft uh, graft compound, as I mentioned before, so we um, it's obtained from from ocean cycle certified material. So we end up after we're we've converted, it's still 91% post consumer recycled content. So our formula basically is 91% um, um, PET, um, and the rest of it is our secret sauce, so to speak, that gives it 
really unique properties. And as I've said many times, it's an engineer, engineering grade material. Then we have our, our we have a the, another grade that's even higher impact, same same type of idea, um, but higher impact uh, properties, um, which is a new development for us for, to meet even higher standards for engineering grade materials. And what what we're really focused on is complete circularity. So as as Ryan kind of pointed out in his slide, it starts you know we it starts with ocean bound material that which eventually gets converted into flake which gets reconverted into pellets and we use it in pellet form um, then we um, next step is, is our process where we put it through a compounding step twin screw extrusion you know as I said graft on that soft segment onto it which gives it outstanding impact resistance chemical resistance and also makes it very easy much easier than plain PET uh, to process in terms of um, um, injection molding or, or extrusion, um, so it's 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 ready to go. Um, uh, then it gets turned in at at uh, nine o'clock. There it gets turned into a uh, durable good. You know, it could be. A, I'll talk a little bit about some of the end applications in a minute. Um, and at the end of the life of that part, um, it can be reground, uh, turned back into pellets, and we can make the same part all over again. So we've done programs. Um, sort of on the pilot scale level right now, but with great results where we just take the part, whatever it was, we have people that can grind it, we can feed it back into our process, and you can sell it, use it for the same part all over again. So here's a little bit more about what, we're, what we actually do to the product. Um, you know, we take the PET molecule, um and it's, it's a graft the grafting is is really a it's, it's what you end up really with is, is a copolymer it's attached to the chain it's uh highly durable it's not it's it's not going to um lose molecular weight or anything it's not a it's not an alloy it's an actual it's more like a copolymer So as I said, it makes it much easier once we do this, once we add that other segment, it makes it much easier to process. Anyone who, who processes plain PET knows it's a, it's a challenge. Um, it's much easier with our material. Um, got a credible, uh, very, very high impact resistance at low temperature. Uh, it was designed for like uh, freezer applications where it was designed to withstand impact uh, at, at negative 40 uh, Fahrenheit. Um, Tensile strength modulus and impact resistance are all uh, similar to like an ABS or uh, polycarbonate uh, or those alloys of those two are those are sort of the where we're kind of a drop in for those materials. Uh, the elongation of break is is superior in most most cases. Um, as I've said, low temperature uh, ductility, very good. Um, very good heat stability. So if you're making large parts and uh, the material sits in the barrel of the extruder for a long time. It's, it, it maintains its viscosity uh, very well and very good chemical resistance as well. And as we said, it's being used where using the same mold, the same tooling that people were using for things like ABS, polycarbonate, uh, and, and, and alloys of various things. So you don't, you don't need to build, build a new mold. Often, most times, you don't need to build a, a new mold to, to use our material. So here's some of the data on the on the properties, and I've actually got a. We can answer some questions at the end um, um, on any 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 questions you might have on this. But you can see modulus is, is pretty is quite high. Um, the, of note, the notch IZOD on this, the 0624, is 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 a bit sensitive, 1.6. Um, you know, melt index is normal for engineering grade materials. This is the higher impact. Uh, version the 1041, and you can see the notch IZOD uh, there is goes it goes up to 15, so it's very very high, very very not not notch sensitive like most PETs are. And if you compare these to uh, some other materials, um, you can see where it stacks up versus our, ours are on the two on the left, and then uh, poly ABS generic. Polycarbonate, 
um, and the rest of those. It's it's a uh, very durable material and and with 90% plus recycled content. So we're talking to brands and and uh, you know in in various industries who really have you know very high um, expectations and, and desires and goals around using sustainable materials. A lot of it's you know a lot of a lot of what's going on now is around packaging. The difference with us is you can put it into products you know that last that aren't single use that last uh, you know designed to last to last the, the life of the vehicle or the life of the personal computer or the furniture. Um, it's been used for pens, chairs, um, and, and various industrial housings and things like that as well. So we're delighted to 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 uh, be working. Very excited about the ocean bound finding a source of, of ocean bound material that we can really rely on and that our customers can rely on, and. We just want to, like everyone who's talked today, we want to get it to scale where um, this is this is not a novelty to use ocean round or, or ocean recovered plastics. It's the norm, and we we really make a dent in this terrible problem that that we're all working on. So, thanks for your time. Thank you, Ashley, for having me and 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 uh, everyone for listening. Appreciate it. Wonderful. Thanks, Scott. So at this time, I'm going to ask. Um, all of the uh, panelists to rejoin us um, online with our webcams as we kind of shift gear um, to go into that uh, Q&A session. So let me get folks back online. Looks like everybody's popping up there. So we've got two Scott and a Ryan. Let's see if we can get Andy, Mark, wonderful. So while folks are are, um, are popping on there, um, I'll give Mark just a couple of seconds to uh, take a look at the questions that you guys have submitted and we'll just uh, make another reminder. Um, for those of you who want to submit a question, please do so um, in the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, and I, I want to thank all of our speakers, um, you know, for joining us and for sharing that information today. I mean, I think there's, if there's one thing to take away from, you know, this webinar, and I hope you take a lot, but I think everybody, no matter what organization, no matter what company, um, everybody who's, you know, on this call today, I think can all agree that uncollected plastics do not involve, do not belong in the marine environment. And, you know, we at Plastic support data-driven research efforts that identify opportunities to meaningfully address marine debris. And I think throughout um, today's webinar, that is exactly what we have tried to showcase. And we've tried to showcase the amount of collaboration that it's truly going to take to make a difference um, out there today. And so, you know, again, going back to, I think, and I hope that we walked you through, you know, how important it was for Andy to meet Scott and for Ryan to meet the other Scott um, to help work together um, on, on putting some of these supply chains together. And so I hope that, you know, we're in a little bit of a different time today where we're all quarantined, but I hope that you guys continue to join webinars like this that, you know, plastics and all of our other partner associations in the plastic supply chain are pulling together for you guys while you can't get out and do that in-person networking and we hope that when we all can come back and do in-person events again that you'll come back to those because you know again it just this webinar and the connection that these speakers have I think just goes to show you how important it's all going to be for us to work together so um, with that monologue there, Mark. I would like to uh, turn it over to you to uh, see what kind of questions our audience has for us today. Thanks, Ashley. Um, I, I agree with you. I think one of the things that was really terrific about the speakers that we were able to hear today is that we saw the entire value chain from the collection and management of these um, you know, materials uh, all the way through the creation of a, of a terrific product in order to utilize it effectively. So I think that's really exciting. It's 
it's that it's that value chain creation that we all need in order to be able to move these materials from an issue uh, to an opportunity. So we have a lot of questions today, um, and I'm just going to take these in order as they came in, and these kind of come in in order of the speakers who spoke. So the first uh, question is to Andy, and the question is, do you have a sense of how your quote epicenter compares to others around the world in terms of volume of plastics that wash up? And how are you, how much are you collecting and how are you collecting still on a regular basis? And then additionally, um, what types of organizations are funding your collection efforts? I think you're still on mute, Andy. Hey Andy, you're still on mute. If you could go ahead and uh, unmute your your line there. Sure. I'm sure you okay. I'm sure you said the most brilliant thing ever <laughs> while we were muted. Um, so if you can try to remember how brilliantly you said it again, thanks so much. Um, yeah, the the comparison is difficult. Alaska itself has 30,000 miles of uh, coastline, um, and fewer than a million people, and so. Um, you know, most of our coastline is uninhabited, whereas a lot of the developing world coastlines are, are inhabited. So I don't have uh, great comparisons between um, pounds per mile in Alaska versus, um, versus the rest of the world. Um, I can say, um, you know, after the tsunami, a uh, paper was published by Washington Sea Grant, which uh, demonstrated uh, through modeling that about half of the tsunami debris would let, that made landfall at all would make landfall in Alaska. So it's a huge, uh, oceanographically, it's a huge amount that gets driven up there. And then we have the last aerial survey was flown in 2012. So what's really out there across that 30,000 miles? Um, it's difficult to know. The best we can do is fly over it and take pictures. Um, the, uh, the quantity is tremendous. Uh, the um, Kayak Island, for instance, um, we were generating, just with a crew of 12, uh, we were generating um, about five tons a day, just, just picking it up and bagging it, um, five tons per day. And so, um, you know, I, I find that it's, it's very productive, um, especially in the collection points uh, along the north gulf coast of Alaska scene. What I, I term that the epicenter, Kayak Island and Montague Island, they're both of them essentially uninhabited islands. They're both huge. But they have a certain aspect where uh, uh, ocean currents bring them near and then wind pushes, uh, pushes those in, uh, up onto a beach and, and that's why they collect that way. Can't remember if there were, there were many parts to that question, but. Uh, there, there were, yeah. So I think the only other part is uh, the question of uh, who is typically funding your collection efforts? What types of groups oh, are sure. Right. So, um, so Scott and I are hoping to fund through, um, you know, fund through grants and uh, through our tra traditional grantors. NOAA is an agency which traditionally funds marine debris cleanup. They have an annual program and, and I would call mid-sized cleanups. They're not at the scale that they're needed. I always sort of make that point. Um, but, uh, and then we're using, you know, through involvement in, in this supply and demand, you know, we hope that, that one day we can find revenue streams that are sort of market-based and no longer uh, government grants. But uh, through my nonprofit, Island Trails Network, uh, I'm operating under grants from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and NOAA right now. Very good. Thank you. Um, this next question is for Scott Farling. Um, Scott, when plastics become degraded, broken, and mixed up, can we still put them into pyrolysis reactors? And and do we just end up seeing what kind of fuel we can get, or is there predictable methods to to understand what's coming out of a pyrolysis with mixed material going in? Yeah. So, um, you know, pyrolysis is a robust technology, but it still requires uh, uh, a well-managed feedstock. So you can't just take ocean plastics and dump it in a pyrolysis reactor and get a useful product out the other end. Um, and that's part of what our research will work towards is 
identifying what fractions are best suited for uh, pyrolysis. Typically, it's uh, the polyolefins and polystyrene. Uh, they work well in pyrolysis to convert oil. Um, other materials like PET just don't. Um, they, they're, they're a contaminant. So we need to do that sorting work for pyrolysis. And that's why we're looking at a range of technologies. You know, if, if we're unable to sort to the level of purity needed to create a, a, a good oil product or naphtha, um, we can also look at things like gasification and, and make syngas and convert that to methanol or ethanol. So there's a lot of different pathways and it's, it's really uh, taking the time to research the best pathways uh, uh, and the most economical pathways for, uh, for each fraction. Very good, thank you. Um, this this uh, question is for Ryan. Ryan, have you focused on uh, educating people about leaving litter on beaches, whatnot? Do you have an educational component to what you do? I mean, yes, yeah, we there. You know, the, primarily we interface with the recyclers or processors in these areas in, in Southeast Asia and where we work and they will typically have an, an education component, but a, a lot of the education is, you know, the collector networks are very adapt to bringing in the right material. I mean, they, they know what is valuable and what's not. Um, and so, you know, they, they'll focus on the beaches. They'll, they'll pick that stuff up um, and, and bring it in. They, they learn over time. A lot of times the collection centers will, will have posted, you know, what material is valuable. Um, and what you know what it sells for that day and so those collectors know that and that's what they're after when they're out there picking okay very good thank you um this next question also is for you ryan uh it says do you have a figure for the amount of quantity of ocean plastic currently ocean bound plastic currently available globally in tons and any projections for volume growth in the next two to five years um, well, I mean, we have the, you know, the general figure from uh, the Jambex study in 2018 that says 8 million metric tons of plastic, you know, enters the ocean every year. Um, I think, uh, you know, what we know is that we have, you know, right now through the certification over 3,000 tons on a monthly basis of PET, um, probably about, you know, 1,000 to 1,500 tons of the combination of PP and, and, and PE. Uh, available and and we're just getting started. I mean, I think we could we could do ten times that, you know, with it with, with a couple more certified processors. Um, there, what we are seeing is there's no shortage of material out there. And I know, uh, oftentimes when we hear uh, some of the companies or or brands talk about commitments, they'll say, well, there's just not enough material, and and we we just are not seeing that at this point. I mean, there's still a lot of recycled material available in these places and. And the demand for that material is what drives us to certify and set up additional networks. Understood, thank you. Uh, this is sort of a general question for the group. Are any of these organizations, any of you folks, working with the Alliance to End Plastic Waste? Uh, I, we are I can just say, Andy and I are not as part of the Ocean Plastics Recovery Project, um, but uh, but uh, another organization I work with, uh, Titus Murph Services, is investigating that as an opportunity. Uh, I, I think they're doing uh, really important work. You know, we Andy and I are focused on cleaning up the stuff once it's been in the ocean, and and we believe that's really important work. Um, but preventing it in the first place is what's most important, and the the work they're doing to build uh, and and uh, and fund the building of infrastructure in the developing countries is is really critical to end the end the leakage to the ocean in the first place so um uh, we, we fully support their efforts you're good um I, there are a couple questions here that are asking some specific questions about costs associated with collection um and pricing and you know per uh, the restrictions that you have on a webinar like this i would encourage you to reach out to the individuals uh, to get those questions answered um Let's see here. Um, so we have uh, one interesting. I would, I'll just, uh, Mark, I would just chime in on the cost. I mean, I won't get into specifics, but, you know, as we talked about in, uh, you know, cost is a big focus of what we're doing when we're talking about scale and, and those types of things. The 
the, the, there's a trace of there's a cost for that traceability. A lot of that goes back into these recyclers and the collection networks, um, but it's not uh, so high that it would prevent companies from using uh, you know large volumes of the material. Okay, understood. Um, this is a, again a general question, um, asking how environmentally friendly is it to collect these plastics and then have them shipped back to the central United States, either from other places in the world or even from remote areas of Alaska, in order to be converted back into pellet and used? Does anybody have a a feel for that? Um, I since I was named, I'll take a shot at it. Um, uh, Kodiak in particular is, uh, uh, we're an exporter of seafood. That happens primarily in refrigerated containers. Um, but we also have a, a grocery store and a Walmart and we bring in dry goods. So we export empty containers to Seattle anyway. Um, this is, uh, this is backhaul, uh, of filling what would otherwise be empty containers. So I think there's room in the, in the, uh, you know, for some level of transportation of product through just empty voids in the infrastructure, um, which is what we're doing now. I would just chime in that um, Polyvisions is owned by a parent called Bemis Associates and um, a film, film adhesive manufacturer with global reach. And we're committed to addressing that problem. It, 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 it is a problem, it is, it is an issue. And, you know, manufacturing locally uh, you know, in multiple plants locally in Asia or, or Europe, where, wherever the product is used, is is definitely part of our plan to prevent shipping all over the world. Yeah, and, and I would say from our perspective, you know, we started in Southeast Asia for two reasons. You know, one is that's where we we see a huge part of the problem, but also it's close to a lot of the manufacturing hubs. So. So that, but we're also, you know, that's why we've also identified um, recyclers in, in South America, Central America, and even um, even in North Africa to locate closer to where people might use the material. And why not? I'll, I'll add in too. Um, I, I would just say that's part of the reason why we've uh, included environmental impact assessment as part of our research. That we want to understand uh, that that we're choosing the best solutions. Uh, for recovering this material and getting it out of the environment, uh, but with an eye towards uh, minimizing impacts. Okay. Um, we've only got a few minutes left here, and I, I have a couple questions for Scott Howard. Um, Scott, what technology is used to make sure ocean plastics is consistent in terms of quality? And as a user of plastics like this, how can I be assured of continuity of supply if I source ocean plastics? Um, it's, it's a question that's what lots of people ask and, and um, you know, a lot of the consistency of supply, you saw Ryan's, um, Ryan's presentation on, on, on certifying it. Um, the, at every step of the process from, um, you know, from uh, discarded items on a, on a beach to, to uh, um, the pellets that we use to make our product, there's checks uh, most most thoroughly on the when it when you convert it from um, flake to pellet. It's almost like a re you know not in terms of energy use or anything like that, but in terms of, of technology, it's it's in uh, consistency of product. It's like remaking it into a polymer, and there's there's a number of checks on molecular weight and contamination levels. Um, there's reach compliance on most of, on you can get reach compliance on these and FDA. No objection letters, um, so it's we're all aware of it very much, and every 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 person who touches this along the way knows that it has to be it has to be pure to have real value. All right, very good. I just say uh, there there is supply, you know, so uh, you know, shipping tomorrow if needed. So ha happy to help people who are interested. Okay. Um, uh, another question. I don't know how much time we have left here, Ashley. I know we're getting pretty close to 1230. Um, I had, maybe we can make this our last question. I don't know, but, um, I know that even in the plastics recycling committee and the work that we've done, um, films tend to be our more challenging of materials, mostly because of their light bulk density and their relative volumes. Um, what work is being done 
to uh, try and collect and make use of, of either ocean bound or ocean collected plastic film. How does that present challenges for you? We, for, from our perspective, we actually don't find a lot of film uh, up along the Alaska coastline. There is there is some amount of it, uh, but it's mostly uh, rigid plastics, uh, foamed materials, and um, uh, and nets and lines. Okay. Uh, we we see lots of films. I, I mean, they're they're all over in, in the areas where we work, especially like from these little sachets and stuff, because people don't buy full bottles of shampoo or something like that, they might get a, a little bit. Um, a lot of times what we'll see is that a, a collector will make a conscious choice to to pick up a, you know, something like a PET bottle because of, of the value of that bottle and, and the weight compared to what they'd have to pick up and the amount of work they'd have to do on the films. And so the, like, again, these collectors are, they're smart and they will do the, you know, they're going to go after what's the best value for their time and their energy. And so, um, you know, getting those films, I think, would require some sort of uh, additional, you know, I don't know, push or, or pull from demand for, for those films. And so that the collectors feel like it's worth their time to say this, this bottle versus this, this piece of film. And it's, an, it's another reason to really work on infrastructure in these developing countries so that it's, it's not something that needs to be collected uh, after the fact that it's collected as part of the, the infrastructure. Um, Ashley, at this point, can should we turn it back over to you? I think we're at our 12.30 mark. A bit. Uh, hi, everyone. So thank you again. Um, I just wanted to show back up one last time and uh, give a sincere thank you to Mark um, for leading us through the session today and to our speakers, to Andy, to Scott, to Ryan, and to the other Scott. Um, thank you all so much for sharing your experiences um, in this space and sharing with us how, you know, this these great examples of how the supply chain is working together. Um, I know there's a lot of people out there who are working on marine plastics. And so I hope this has given you guys um, a, a good uh, bit of insight um, into to what is happening. And so um, just really brief closing remarks. So I want to thank um, all of our speakers and their contact information is on the screen. If there's a question that you have or you want to reach out to them directly and you didn't get to do that today. Um, also, I just want to um, remind you once again, like I said, um, even though we can't be together in person, um, we at the Plastics Industry Association, and I know lots of our, our friends and other partner associations are doing the same, we're going to try to keep bringing you content um, throughout the year so that you can uh, learn more about your colleagues in the plastics industry and what, you know, what they are doing. Um, and we're going to still try to uh, do networking the best way that we can. So our next session, um, episode two of our webinar series is going to be on June 17th. And during that session, we're going to have a conversation about life cycle analysis and how companies in the plastic supply chain can use LCAs and the data that they uh, both create uh, to tell uh, the stories of their plastic materials. So thank you again to our sponsors of today's um, program, to Midland Compounding and Consulting, to Plastic Machinery Magazine and Plastic Recycling Magazine, um, and to Star Plastics. So um, thank you guys again. And uh, again, education, innovation, collaboration, uh, let's keep finding ways to work together. And uh, we hope to see you guys in person again soon. Hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you. Thank you.